Cool. Okay. We can start. And if anyone misses the introduction, it's probably not that big of a deal. Um, well, thank you for coming to um, our workshop on publishing and sharing your research. Um, my name is Miranda Fair. I'm the publishing and open scholarship librarian here. I'm Carrie Price. I'm the research impact and health professions librarian here at Towson. So uh, the key points we're planning to hit today, um, we're going to talk a bit about the publishing landscape and publishing in general, um, and then we'll go into library resources for publishing. We'll talk about different scholar profiles and persistent identifiers. So here are some examples here. And then we will end with talking about impact and should have time for questions. Um, so I think we're all pretty familiar with like the version of record, the one that actually, when we're publishing a paper actually gets published in the journal. Um, a few other versions that might be floating around or you might be able to do something with that just want to like define because sometimes I feel like the terms get interchanged when they shouldn't be. Um, so you have the preprint or submitted versions. This is going to precede your formal peer review. Um, sometimes these are made available before publication in repositories like Archive. I'd say that's more common. Um, BioArchive, Repack, some of the others that might be discipline specific in different disciplines. Um, sometimes posting a an open access version of something is required or allowed by the funder. Most of the time they're going to allow you to um, share your preprints. Um, sometimes journals require you to take it down upon publication, but not always. We'll look at something that lets us know, like a way to look up what journals allow us to do and what they don't allow us to do. Um, and then in some disciplines, um, researchers will annotate each other's preprints, which is cool. Um, there's also the postprint or author's accepted manuscript. So this version is peer reviewed. So this is the sort of the final text, if you want to think about it that way, um, but it precedes publication. So it's not, it might not include some like fine tuned copy editing. It's not going to have the formatting. It's not going to have the journals like PDF layout. Um, uh, again, it's also called the author's accepted manuscripts. You'll see AAM probably. Um, you can find these in repositories like PubMed Central. They might also show up in institutional repositories like ours is ScholarWorks at Towson, but it would be different at a different institution. Um, so now that we've talked about that, we'll uh, talk about publication models a bit. Um, subscription access is what we're used to because it's been the dominant model for a long time. Um, that is the like libraries or institutions or readers, but usually it's institutions um, on their behalf, are going to pay um, for read access to all of these articles that get published. Um, Open access is becoming more common lately um, because of different rules that are changing and um, the internet has made it way easier to share stuff. And um, now that journals aren't having to be like physically printed and bound anymore. Um, so in both cases, if the, if the journal's good, and most of the time they are good, um, but of course there's some that are low quality, both um, that are subscription access and open access, it just depends. They will have an editorial board. They'll both be peer reviewed, unless they say otherwise. They're indexed in major databases. That might vary depending, um, like which databases. Um, they can be for profit or they can be nonprofit. Um, so usually, there's the big academic, big name academic publishers. We all know those are typically going to offer other for profit, but they'll offer subscription access journals and some open access journals. We'll talk about the differences um, in journal types in a bit. Um, but a lot of like smaller scholarly societies or nonprofits, they still will put out subscription journals, but they also might put out an open access journal. Um, the big differences uh, have to do with who's paying and um, like where the money is coming from and what the copyright rules are. So typically in subscription journals, the readers or institutions, like I said, are going to pay for read access in open access. Um, sometimes the authors or organizations are going to pay to publish, but not all the time. Um, there are some ways around that, um, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and then in subscription access, copyright is usually kept by the publisher. I think if you want to cross that part out of your author agreement, in a lot of cases, you just can. They just aren't going to publicize that you're allowed to do that. Um, but usually by design um, in open access journals, they're going to um, allow authors to retain their copyright, typically using a Creative Commons license. They might stipulate which one you need to use. They might give you an option. Um, of which one you can pick. And they're open for everybody to read. So that is the difference. 
Um, so open access is a very, very broad term that encompasses a lot of different um, ways of sharing. Basically, all they have in common is like anybody can read this, but there are some differences between these. Um, so green open access, um, which green and gold and hybrid, these ones on this page are probably the most common. You'll see them a lot of the time. Green open access is going to be repository based OA. So this is something that's been self archived. You put that in like Med Archive, PubMed Central, any other OA repository. It's typically free. Usually it's pre prints um, and post prints or authors accepted manuscripts. They probably aren't going to let you do the published final version, but some sometimes they do. Um, these might be subject to an embargo period. So your publisher might say, like, you can't do this until uh, your article. We've had your article out for 12 months, and after that, you're allowed to do it. Um, then gold open access is like a more established journal based OA. So gold refers to a fully open access journal. Sometimes you'll hear hybrid journals, which I'll go over shortly, referred to as like gold OA, but that's not accurate. Um, so these are almost exclusively published by for-profit commercial publishers. These will be like the big names, um, like Elsevier, uh, Wiley, those types of things. There are some other born OA for-profit commercial publishers like Frontiers. They also use this model and they're funding through APCs, which is article processing charges, which um, I did a, one of these workshops on last week. So if you're interested in hearing a whole thing about APCs, um, the recording should be up soon. Um, the then uh, hybrid OA are subscription journals in which like the access rules about the articles in the journal are split. So an article can't be hybrid, but a journal can be hybrid. So some of the articles are open access for a fee. Um, so someone's paying APCs, um, uh, but they're also still collecting subscription costs um, for access to the other articles. So I think they're double dipping on revenue streams. I think a lot of people share that sentiment. Um, sometimes publishers will say, like this is a gold OA, but but it's not. Um, I don't love the taxonomy of like using these dis terms that aren't super descriptive. Um, because I don't think it it obscures what it actually means to people. Um, which is annoying. But a few other like less common, but you'll still see these sometimes. Diamond open access, which is thankfully becoming more common. So these are journals that have a different funding model. They're they don't charge anybody to read, but they also don't charge um article processing charges to authors. So typically they're going to be a lot smaller. They'll be um, run by um, maybe like a small group of um, scholars at an institution. Typically the funding is going to come from third parties. So it might be philanthropic organizations. They might be funded by a grant. Um, sometimes universities or libraries will give them money to run it. Um, so they, they get their money a different way. Um, well, gold OA, I'd say is the dominant way of doing things in, um, Europe and North America, which maybe is changing. There's been some like shifts in the <laughs> discussion, like the past few weeks or so. Um, diamond OA is, um, most, uh, it's, it's like the dominant model in Latin America. Um, and they, they do it pretty well. So they have a pretty good system for it. Um, you might also hear something called bronze open access. This is free to read content offered online by a publisher. So um, like the health sciences papers during COVID-19 that we all like were able to read whether or not we had access to um, it through our institution. Um, oftentimes these aren't going to um, give you reuse guidelines so they won't have like a creative commons license or it'll be really unclear um, or they won't have like it might be like an all rights reserved copyright. It doesn't really tell you. Um, and then perpetual access isn't guaranteed. So either like there's no nothing set up for um, like depositing it somewhere where like if that website goes away, it's going to be preserved somewhere else. There's no long term preservation. Um, so if the website goes, it's just gone or they could just like pull access to it at any point. Um, and then there's like, you know, piracy is technically like you can access things for free. Um, it's not really an OA model. Occasionally people like conflate it with OA, which is why I mention it. Um, that refers to a different thing. And I'm not saying to do it, but it exists. It's a thing people do. Um, so you when you're picking what you want to do, whether you want to go with subscription access or one of these different open access models for your own publications, um, it's important to think about like what is important to you and where you're at in your career and what you value with it. So um, publishing model, whether you go with open or not, sometimes it's not your call. Sometimes your funder is telling you that you have to make it open access. Um, and 
that's okay. We will talk about ways to look that information up um, soon. It might also be discipline dependent. Some disciplines are all on board with OA. Other ones are a little a little more skittish about it. Um, some of them are going to value like you have to publish in a very specific list of these like high impact journals um, that maybe they're they're not open access. Some disciplines have a culture of sharing preprint, so they care less about sort of what happens to like the version of record um, because someone can get it somewhere. Um, your discipline might also um, be one where you're collaborating a lot or it might be one where typically you have solo authorship. So is it even fully your decision? Is it the decision of a research team? Um, and then whether or not your discipline usually publishes articles or they tend to publish monographs. So there is um, sort of open access books as well. I think they're common, but a little bit less common, becoming more common than articles, just because more articles get published than monographs um, overall. So another thing, too, is maybe you're working outside of your discipline. You're working with collaborators on an interdisciplinary topic that might um, help you decide like whether you want to publish open or not. They might have other opinions about it if they're from a different discipline. Um, another thing, too, is that in this case, you might not um, know necessarily where you want to publish journal wise because it's not um it's not sort of in your typical pool that you pull from because it's a different topic than you're used to or um you're looking for something that's interdisciplinary specifically that you haven't really explored that before um whereas maybe normally you'd ask your colleagues for advice or something um you don't uh necessarily know like what type of journal you want to publish in that is a thing you can uh, always like bounce ideas off me if you'd like i'll share my email um at the end and i think we had at the beginning but that's something i always like talking about i find it interesting it's like a scavenger hunt for me to try to find places you might want to publish um another thing to consider is where you're at in your career if you're early career you're probably very concerned about tenure and promotion if you have tenure it really probably doesn't matter very much where you publish um so that that is going to be another factor to consider. Another one is money, where you're getting it from. If you have a grant that's going to cover APCs, great. If you don't have that and you that's a big concern for you, that's going to affect where you publish. Um, and then another thing you might be very passionate about, like what your author rights are and like what kind of rights you can retain over your work. Um, so I have, we have an example here of the author's rights Um this, this sort of table that Elsevier put out. So they're um, comparing their open access publications with um, the, they're like more traditionally subscription-based publications. So um, they're telling you like what their uh, rights are in their journals, um, the proprietary ones. I know sometimes they put out some society journals, they might have different rules. Um, so they're saying you can you keep your trademark rights, you can use your research data and reuse it without restriction. Um, you can reuse your own material, but you have to acknowledge the original article, you get attribution. This is all kind of the basic stuff. It starts to diverge um, here. So in most cases, in, you can publicly share the preprint. Most of the time, they don't care about that. The accepted manuscript is where it gets different you're allowed to share it somewhere non-commercially if you have um you know open access one they're saying if it's a subscription access you have to use this specific creative commons license that's going to be an attribution non-commercial use no derivatives license um and then typically it's after an embargo period that will vary by the journal um like whether you can publicly share the published article you retain your copyright in the open access case not um in the other case so they give you these like sort of the summary of it, um, of things that they uh, recommend, but a, a lot of the things they have in common, but that's typically um, where it diverges, like what the reuse guidelines are and whether or not you get to retain your copyright. Um, they do mention embargo period here. It's going to vary by journal to say like what you can do with your accepted manuscript. You can find this information typically on a journal page, but there are places, which I will show you momentarily, where you can look up like a lot of different journals um, rather than having to go to all of these individually. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, um, and I talked about this in my APC workshop, 
extensively. So I'll just go over kind of briefly here. Um, there's read and publish agreements. So these are sometimes called transformative or transitional agreements. Again, I don't think those are particularly descriptive terms, whereas read and publish is it, it is what it says it is. So basically a library will make an agreement with the publisher. Typically we were paying for read access to subscription journals. These um, are read and publish. So we're paying them an amount of money. We get read access and in return, um, we, we're also getting um, like, typically it's a waiver. Sometimes it might be a discount. Waivers are better than discounts because you don't have to worry about paying an APC at all. Um, so we have them with certain publishers. So um, I will sort of briefly go over them. We have them with Cambridge, Company of Biologists, ACM Open, and then Springer. And that one's a little different because it's hybrid only. So um, I will share the links in a moment, I guess, as I go. But I've got um, this website open. So this is the Cambridge one. I wish there was a way to get directly to the list of journals that are covered, but you can't link directly to it. Basically, you have to go to this page every time and put in that we're in the United States and we are at House and University. Um, if you click this, it'll tell you like the discount, which is full, which is great. They'll give you a list of all these journals. You can search and filter by subject if you'd like. For this one, it's pretty easy. All you have to do is um, make sure that you're the corresponding author and that it's you're using your Towson email. Um, and then they send it to us and say, hey, does this person really work there? And we go, yes, they're eligible. And then they waive your APC, which is nice. Um, and they've got more information about that here. Um, Company of Biologists is a newer one. So we have a direct agreement with them. Um, a lot of the other ones we do through like consortium. This one, we've got the five journal package. So any of these are covered if you want to publish in biology. Um, that's a waiver for the full cost. Same setup. Just make sure it's like your email we approve um, to make sure that you actually work here and then you are good to go. Um, then ACM Open, this is a um, Association for Computing Machinery. This one's a little more complicated. So if for some reason you want to publish in one of these, I, I would just reach out to me and we'll discuss like how this works because it's set up a bit differently. I won't get too deep into it. Um, and then Springer, I think this is the one most people are excited about. So this is an agreement that we get through Lyricist. Um, they just negotiated it finally finished so this it's pretty new that we have this um they also don't have the most like fun website to look at because to look at the eligibility you have to open this document to like look at eligible journals you have to go to this very not searchable excel sheet um so I found the best way to do this is to like look for journals that they publish that you'd be interested in publishing in and then cross checking it on the list versus just trying to find something from the list. Um, then one thing to note about this is that it does not cover fully open access journals. It only covers hybrid journals. Um, they're, they're protecting their revenue stream. Um, and the other thing to note that's important is that even though it's like Springer Nature, um, it only covers these Springer like branded journals. So any of the Nature branded things are not covered under this. Um, it also are these are other places, but these are like you can publish like monographs um, under these imprints. Um, but that is what that covers. So um, a few library resources for publishing. The first one we'll look at is uh, Sherpa Romeo, which I've been hinting at a lot, talking about like, how do I find information about embargo periods and what version the journal is going to let me share and um, things like that. So this is a very useful website. Um, they're, they're kind of changing their um, way that they have they have like a new version in beta which we can look at that too um but what it does is it brings together all of their different products so sherpa romeo is you look up, it helps you look up publisher and journal open access policies and it provides a pretty useful and readable summary um like a fake or not a fake like a real journal um like a journal of environ american journal of environment and climate Let's see. Okay. So it you it'll take you to what the publisher is. Super familiar with those. The one that give you a link, the ISSN, and it'll tell you what the publisher policy is. So in this case, um 
this is pretty straightforward they just have you publish it's an open access journal they don't appear to charge you money for it um or they just are lacking the information there's no embargo you have to publish under a cc by i'm going to go to a one that is i know for a fact is way more complicated okay the journal of academic librarianship so this this is an elsevier journal so um it tells you what the publisher is print and electronic ISSN and a link to this directly. A lot of this information is like pulled from the journal website. So this has a lot of different article versions versus the other one, which just talked about accepted and um, submitted. So for the published version, they're saying, um, because there's like the pound sign here, expiration website, that this is going to require some kind of money. So an APC or an APC paid by waiver. Um, this time this little hourglass symbol means that um there's no embargo and that it'll tell you like if there's any license requirements that you're allowed to do and also where you can share it so in these cases you can put it your published version on um if you pay the fee you're allowed to share your published version other places um again that's sort of a repeat of that just some other places you can share it Sometimes they've got these um, like prerequisite funders. So it'll be this exclamation point that shows up. A lot of these are like um, British foundations because I think it's it's sort of more robust and they've been doing it a little bit longer. Um, but again, the same requirements like where you, the publishers will deposit here, what the embargo is, what the license is. Then the accepted version, that's where you're like, okay, maybe I don't want to pay this open access fee, but where am I allowed to share this other version of my work to make sure like someone can read it at least um you're allowed to put it on your website in this case they're going to stipulate that you use this certain um creative commons license there's no embargo which is nice this other one is saying you can put it on your website immediately but you want if you want to put it in an institutional repository or subject repository you're going to have to wait 12 months but again same um thing and then typically they're going to say for the submitted version so this is not going to be the period reviewed version that you can basically just do whatever you want with it um usually they'll say like yeah published source must be acknowledged with citation so like once your published version comes out they want you to um link the doi so people are able to get the published version from there um but that's the sort of a pretty typical one of these go to their site so they do have a few other um services that i did want to mention um because they're helpful for looking other things up. So um, there's also Sherpa Juliet, which that talks about different funder mandates and funder policies. Um, oh, they've added open access books. That's cool. Um, Fact is the like compliance tool. So it's checking like, like open access compliance policies. Um, there's Open Door, which is another one that they've also included in here that um, I guess they explain it. Okay, cool. So <laughs> Open Door was the um like repository finder. So that should still be in there. And then I think these things are new. And I guess they're adding statistics, which that'll be fun. Um, I think the interface looks nice, but I sort of liked the old one too. Um, so that is this one tool that can be helpful. And I did not share the link yet, so I'll do that. And it's still in beta, but I think it works pretty well. Um, another thing to is uh Cabell's Journalytics and Predatory Reports, which are we subscribe to through the library. So we have a link to it from our publishing guide, but I learned this morning I need to update the link. So we're gonna go here from the database list. Um I'm just gonna jump straight to see. Okay. There's two links for journalytics and predatory reports, but they're basically in the same place. Um you can toggle between them pretty easily. Actually I think maybe they yeah, they might include them in the same search now, which is nice. Yeah, they changed their interface also. I think it looks nicer than it used to. Um, so it'll give you information. Um, you can do kind of all journals, which is going to include both things in here. Usually what's in journalytics is it's going to give you um, some like metrics. It'll tell you some information about the journal. Um like what discipline it is. This is like mostly economics, um, whether it's open access or not. In this case, it's hybrid open access. Um, they've got information about alt metrics, which we'll talk about a bit later. They give you an estimated acceptance rate. Keep in mind that that's typically self-reported by the journal. So um, take it with a grain of salt. Like who is the sponsor of the journal? Sometimes they'll talk about the different scope 
Um, and then they'll have a link to the website. And there's these different tabs up here that's got more information that's kind of helpful to tell you what the open access fees are. So they're they're pretty high for this. Um, and then submission information will have usually links to manuscript guidelines. Um, so the, this is a pretty helpful tool for like checking out journal information um, for journals you might be interested in publishing in. And then sort of the flip side of that is predatory reports. This one can just be fun to look at because of the drama. So they, um, they put journals here and they'll ding them for like a lot of different things. I want to find one with a lot of violations. Okay, these ones seem to have a lot. So, um, they, the, this means that they've like done something that is probably not so great. So look at this one. Um, so they're saying they've got three public publication practice violations, some access violations, fee violations, peer review violations, and the list what they are. So, okay. And then they've now changed like levels of severity which i think is is cool that they have them put out this way because sometimes it's actually it's not as big of a deal and other things that are a big deal like they're saying there is a fee but they don't really give information on the amount which they should be telling you that up front or give conflicting information um maybe they're saying they're not doing enough to like prevent plagiarism a very large editorial board but very few articles are published it's yeah probably moderate or minor but um, yeah, no articles are published or they're missing stuff. That's pretty severe. That might just be like, and, and sometimes things can, things can get taken off of here if they fix them. So sometimes like very new journals will get dinged for things that they are able to fix later. Um, I'm curious about this one to mark these as predatory, the claims. Okay. So again, this is, there's nothing or they're missing things. Sometimes there'll be like no policies for digital preservation. I want to find something like very egregious because sometimes there's like, okay, this one looks like it has a lot. Um, Yeah, they don't have an editor or an editorial board. That's probably not great. Um, They don't have their fear review po peer review policy, surprise fees. They've said that's a severe violation. Anyway, these can be kind of fun to look at. Um, So uh, if this is a good place to check if you're like, no, nah, I'm not 100% sure about this journal. I'm going to run it through here. And again, not everything is going to show up on here the same way not everything is going to show up on Journalytics. So if something doesn't show up on here, it doesn't necessarily mean you can't publish in it. And if something doesn't show up on here, it doesn't necessarily mean it's like completely vetted and good. Um, so that is just a useful tool. Um, we'll talk about these finding tools in Scopus very shortly, but I wanted to briefly discuss um, the Directory of Open Access Journals. So um, the Directory of Open Access Journals is where they will index um, a lot of open access journals. Um, this can be really helpful, especially for like smaller publishers or journals that are run out of universities, um, because typically those aren't going to be as well indexed in places like Scopus or Web of Science, whereas like the big commercial journals that were used to be a subscription access model and then flipped away typically are going to be. Um, I will share this link. So, so you can look up um, journals and articles that maybe you want to read or maybe you want to publish in. Um, let's find some psychology journals. So they'll give you a list of them here. Um, they don't just have things in English, which is cool, um, but you can filter by language if maybe you only read or publish in English. So and that's already knocked out a few of them. Um, then yeah, we'll look at logical methods in computer science. That one seems fun. So if you click on this, it'll tell you, it'll give you a link to the website where, the ISS, where it is in the ISSN portal. In this case, they are not charging publication fees. So this actually has a lot of similar information and looks a bit like Journalytics, the way they have it set up. Um, so it's similar information. They'll give you direct links to like what the peer review policy is, what the aims and scope are, and um, sort of expectation for like how long it takes to publish in there, what their deposit policy is. It's good to have one of those. Copyright information, um, who the publisher is, what the... Um, Creative Commons license rules are if there was one, like kind of how long they've been around, how long they've been publishing open access, links to these different statements. 
Um, so this one's pretty robust, which is nice. Not all of them are as robust, but some of them are going to be like newer journals. They won't be. Um, if they do charge APCs, they'll usually kind of tell you here. So in this case, this one charges $200, which is not so bad <laughs> compared to some other ones, but some of these will have no charges. If you're looking for ones with no charges specifically, you can check without fees. Um, and that'll filter it to just ones that aren't going to charge you anything. If you're worried about rights retention, you can check this. Most of them are going to allow some of that. And then there's another one, which is the DOAJ seal, which I think they're trying to move to like a different way of um, just giving distinctions to different journals. But currently they're using the DOAJ seal. Um, so journals will have to apply for this. They don't have to hit all of the requirements to get this in order to be indexed here but they do in order to get the seal. So um, this one does usually they have to have like specific digital archive, like telling you so this one, they've got, they're preserving the things in clocks. Um, actually, if you click on this, I think it just tells you everything you have to do. So yeah, you have to have allow self archiving. You need to um, be assigning DOIs. You have to give DOAJ your metadata, specific license types, things like this. Um, so if you're looking for just ones that want have all of these that features, then that is a way you can filter it also. Um, DOAJ is a little bit like slower to get things um, because it is run by people who are finding these things and then vetting them, um, which is good because then you at least know it's not things getting sort of automatically added to it. Um, but I'll actually stop screen sharing now so we can we can switch. Thank you. I always learn something new. All right. So I'm going to take you through some journal finding tools for when you are hoping to publish and you're looking for where to publish. I hope that's what you're seeing right now on my slide. Okay, because it always shows me the other monitor for some reason. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, scholar profiles and Impact. Any questions from Miranda before I move on? You can feel free to use the chat too. Yeah, um, you can better also email me later. I know I always run through my allotted time because I talk so much. I'm trying to get chat up and uh, it's not letting me. There we go. All right. So let me go back here. So I've listed these here in the PowerPoint, which I'm happy to share. But also uh, we have a guide and I'll put a link here in the chat. So help for publishing. These are some of the journal finders. Some are linked to specific publishers. We see Elsevier, IEEE, Springer and Wiley. And then some are a bit more agnostic. There's also Cavils, which Miranda talked about and some journal guides like, well, journal guide and Samago. So we won't look at them all, but I want you to get an idea of what they do. So first I just open the Elsevier Journal Matcher. And um, no lies here, I used ChatGPT to create a fake title and a fake abstract for an article I'd like to publish. So ideally this is your real article title and your real article abstract. And what I'm going to do is, um, sorry, copy that abstract and paste it here after I accept the cookies and find a journal. So here we have a list, much like some of the other lists that Miranda showed you. You can toggle to OA or not, subscription or not. You can toggle based on a site score. If you hover over the information icon, you'll get more information on what the site score means. It's basically an aggregation of the number of cited uh, how many things have been cited over a certain period of time, and then you'll get more information. So these are all Elsevier journals. And if you click on the title of the journal, you'll go up to the journals page. It shows you what the APC is, which is 4,000, which is quite high. People are usually grant funded to do something like that. Time to first decision and review time to acceptance. So you can play around with that. You can change your abstract. You can also just search by keywords. Let's say um, autism. 
and just maybe find some journals based on keywords. But these are Elsevier journals. So we'll go back to our guide here. And the other one I like to show you is um, journal guide. And this one's kind of agnostic. It's not tied to any one publisher. And I'll use my second, my second one here today, which is going to be about autism. Whoops, copy the abstract, plop it in the abstract section, and I'll copy the title. Plop it in the title section, we'll click search. And this is a sort of a consortium of like computer programmers, academics who put this together. And so you can sort by the um, score, which is how it matches to your um, input. You can sort by journal name. You can sort by publisher by impact, which is the SNP, source normalized impact per paper, which is sort of like a impact factor only weighted for disciplines, speed to publication, open access. If you create a free account, you can mark journals that you wanna follow. And if you click on any one, we'll do AJOT, then you'll get more information about AJOT here on their site. And you can always go out to AJOT itself and read more about that. I always like to check out the author instructions. So that's journal guide. We'll go back to the guide here. Um, here's another agnostic one. It's kind of old fashioned in the sense that uh, it looks like an old website. It looks pretty old. We'll find journals based on these keywords I put in. And here it'll show you if it's indexed for Medline. So there's a lot of stuff that shows up in PubMed, but it might be through uh, public access policies or preprints or various ways, the journals that are indexed for Medline have gone through a much more rigorous process and are uh, considered to be reliable, non-predatory, all that. So you could always check these out here. And this one's not so nice, like you can't visit the site here, but then you can go look it up. You can go look up social work and healthcare. I don't know why my computer keeps doing that. So check out some of these tools, putting in your your keywords or your title and your abstract information, and you might get some good hits. Talked about journal guides. Samago is very similar. Miranda talked about the DOAJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals. And these are our guides for you. I wanted to talk about some scholarly researcher profiles. They're pretty important. They're becoming more important. Sometimes they're even required when you submit a manuscript or apply for funding for NIH. It's required to have an ORCID ID. Well, that's redundant. It's an ORCID, Open Researcher and Contributor ID. And this, again, is also a consortium of people. It's not affiliated with any one institution. So there's information here about the ORCID. And you can just sign up, sign in. You can also sign in with your institution. For these, I'll be using myself as an example because I'm me. So let's see if I can get to my ORCID profile today or not. There we go. So this is my backend version of ORCID, but I can provide this link to anybody I can put it on my CV, my tenure and promotion materials, my grant applications, in my email signature, a lot of uses here for that link. And then you get to edit. So if you change names, you can change names, your research products still follow you along. You can add a bio, you can add your employment, you can add your email and your website and social links. And then what's really nice about ORCID, we'll go down to uh, works. These are your research output, research products. And you don't have to add manually, although you can. I'll put ORCID in the chat. When you go to add, you can do search and link. You can add a PubMed ID. You can add a DOI, add manually. I like to do search and link. And then I like to look for Scopus, which is a database we subscribe to. And it'll send me through some syncing 
syncing functions. I pick me, I'm Carrie L. Price. I'm not any of these other people. And click next. It'll show me, are these your publications? And I get to say, I get to look at them and say, oh yeah, these are my publications or no, they're not. And in which case you would check the X. These are mine. So I click next and then next. And then you have to just verify your email address. Oops, it's, it's really kind of archaic. And it's going to send this information to ORCID. And then my ORCID will get updated with this information. So you can always see the more detail here. Who my authors were, the DOI, the journal, all that. You can set these things to be public or private. Maybe you're working on something you're not ready to share yet. So you can always set that to be public or private. Same for everything here, your organizations and affiliations your employment, all that. You can set it to be public or private. So ORCID is great. And pretty much, I think the most common research profile system, it looks like that just in case uh, we lost, just in case we lost access. Another one, like I mentioned is called Scopus. This is a subscription database. Most places seem to have that or Web of Science. So hopefully you have Scopus. I'm just gonna search for it here. And the, the caveat with Scopus is all the metrics it's going to give you is really limited to what's indexed in Scopus, which is quite a lot. But I found out recently for some disciplines, it's not everything. So I found this out with biology in particular. It wasn't all here. This is our main page. We could use it to search for articles, but I'm going to use it to search for authors. Again, me. I'll click search. Now, if there were like 300 carry prices, you can add affiliations. Um, so I'm the one at Towson, and then I'm just going to click on my name. And what you'll get are some really nice visualizations and metrics. My ORCID is linked. This shows my publication graph over time. And the blue bars, um, the blue bars are my documents. The dark blue line are the citations on those documents. These are my most contributed topics. You can see my documents down here in Scopus. Uh, they're always updating this. So actually author metrics is new to me. So I have a 38.1% international collaboration, 2.4% academic corporate. Yeah, so you can always uh, find out more about what this means by clicking on their little info buttons. They're always adding new things here. I'm just going to click back. Oh, forward. The other thing that Scopus has started doing recently is adding in preprints. So if you have a preprint, it'll show you these. I have a couple of preprints. Um, and my co-authors, I have 259 co-authors. So, you know, I'm looking up myself, but you could look up someone you are interested in collaborating with and see who their collaborators are, what their major subjects are and look at their research. So this is Scopus, I really like it. Um, the other one we'll look at is Google Scholar. So normally students use it to look things up that might not be great, but if you establish your profile, you can go to your profile section and here you'll, you'll again get your list of publications who cited them uh, over time. You get some metrics like seven of my articles are not public access, 18% are. We're getting my co-authors again. Um, and then they have an H index and they have an I-10 index. So that's a Google thing, Google Scholar thing. It means that 33, wait, it means that 33 of my articles have been cited at least 10 times. I think that's what it means. The H index, if you have a number, it means that 23 of your publications have been cited at least 23 times. So that's what those metrics mean up there. I recommend having profiles in every place. Google Scholar is going to be the most um, generous because it might duplicate, it might, it might double count, but it's still a really nice. You could just grab this link and you can just send it to people. 
um, an ORCID too, not with Scopus since it's a subscription database that's behind a paywall. So um, in Scopus, you can also get journal lists. Um, let's revisit Scopus for a second. That's up here. If I go back to, well, I'll go to sources. It's up here in the top right. Lots of ways to get there. And here in sources, you can toggle by subject area, title, publisher. You could say um, aging. We're interested in aging journals. And then we'll get some of these journals. And they're not all specifically Elsevier journals. We'll probably see some other ones too. You can sort by source title, by site score, percentile, citations, documents, and percent cited. And we'll go into the journals of gerontology and take a look at its information. You can always do a lot of investigation here. So what does this mean? Well, they're telling you. And you can set a document alert. So if you want it to stay up to date on the publications that are coming out of the journals of gerontology, you can do that. You do need a free account, which can sometimes be a pain. Okay. That's, I always grab screenshots just in case. Um, another one is called The Lens. This is a free website that I just love to pieces. This is what it looks like. I'm gonna put a link in the chat. So you can search for patents. You can search for scholarly works. What I'm going to do is search for profiles. I'm just gonna look for myself and it should give me some options here and I'll recognize myself, that's me. And what I get is kind of a really fun profile. It keeps doing this to me, I don't know why. All right, it takes a minute to load. I think this would be especially helpful for promotion and tenure because it's going to give you some summary stats over here. We'll see what those look like in just a second. And this is pulling in data from my ORCID record because I took the time to establish my ORCID and then to link these up. So I have 61 scholarly works with an open access ratio of 48%. Collaborative means that more than one institution is involved. I have a collaborative ratio of 86%. It's telling me my H index is 22. I have 5,100 citations, no patents. Well, that all checks out with me. And then you can look down here and uh, see your publications and, and get to them that way. You could take this link and send it to a collaborator. It just It's just gonna show up exactly like this. And if it's someone you're interested in following, you can follow them. So that's, that's a couple profile things. I went over Scopus, Orchid, The Lens, and Google Scholar. And we looked at where to find um, some journals you might publish in. We do have a research metrics guide. So there's different types of metrics when you're considering your promotion and tenure packet. Author metrics, article metrics, who's citing you, journal metrics, what's the quality and impact of the journal where you're publishing. There's a tool I really like a lot. It's kind of new. It's called the Altmetric Bookmarklet. And I won't go through the trouble of downloading it and everything, but uh, um, can we try it out? The links aren't working. Well, let me make this really big. What it does is you'll land on a journal article here on the internet. And what happens once you've installed this plugin for your browser, it's gonna show you uh, a score and the score is an aggregation of counts that, oh, three people have blogged about this article. It's been tweeted by 110 people, shared on 10 Facebook pages, mentioned in Google posts. There's more information once you click on that, on that um, metric. So this is a pretty cool tool. Bye, Lisa. And I recommend getting it. I might have it up here, but I don't think so. Altmetric bookmarklet. That wraps up the presentation for today. We're happy to take any questions. This is being recorded and published on our YouTube channel.
please stay up to date on our website. We're offering many more workshops this semester and next semester. And uh, we'll take any questions or concerns.